Um, I'm Alice Mumford from Engender. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar all about mainstreaming. It's very exciting. Um, Engender has launched a report um, today uh, about mainstreaming. I'll pop the link to that in, uh, in the chat um, in a minute. Uh, so uh, some folk on the chat might know a lot about mainstreaming. Some of you might know nothing. You are all in for a treat today. Um, so we're going to be hearing uh, today from Talat Yaku, we're going to be hearing from Emma Rich, and we're going to be hearing from Lindsay Millen, um, talking about uh, why mainstreaming is important, what needs to happen to make mainstreaming work uh, in Scotland, um, and then looking at some specific examples of um, how mainstreaming can make things better for women in Scotland, um, and particular areas that need to be worked on um, to mainstreaming. I'm just going to do a little bit of um, housekeeping um, so I know folk are very familiar with Zoom now, um, probably, but uh, we're using Zoom today. This is a webinar format, so we can't see um, your cameras. Uh, your, your cameras aren't on and we can't hear you as well. So um, feel free to, to eat your lunch, to, uh, to uh, let children, pets, um, partners interrupt, um, all sorts of things. It won't, it won't have an impact on the call. Um, we have the uh, Q&A set up here. So, um, if you have a question, um, either during while the panelists are speaking or afterwards, you can pop it in that, that box and we'll be able to see it and know if there's things to be answered. Um, but if you have technical questions, like you can't hear someone or um, you want to know what someone uses an acronym, um, then you can use the chat box and I'll be able to answer that. We have, um, we've got closed captions happening. We've got subtitles. Um, thank you very much to Amanda for doing those. Um, so you can see them by clicking on the more button. It's probably three little dots on your screen and choosing to see the subtitles, um, choosing to hide them, or you can look at the full transcript, which will appear on the right hand side um, of your Zoom link there. So you can uh, please make use of those if they are helpful for you. Um, Emma will be using some slides during her presentation, so she'll be sharing her screen for that as well. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Um, so uh, please do, we'll have time for question and answer at the end. Like I say, you can be asking questions throughout, but we'll take them at the end there. Um, and uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna turn myself off and hand uh, over to Talat Yaqub, who's gonna talk to us about why we should care about mainstreaming. Thank you, Alice, and thanks to Engender for inviting me along today. I hope everyone's well, or I understand that, that that question and sentence has lost all meaning, but I hope you're as well as you can be in the current current climate run. Um, so my name's uh, Talit Yacoub. I'm an independent consultant and researcher, and um, I've had the privilege of working with Engender in lots of different ways, um, just as part of the wider sisterhood within uh, the feminist movement in Scotland. And gender mainstreaming might feel dry, but it's actually much, much more critical than we give it credit for. Um, gender mainstreaming is essentially the way in which we can create coherence across policy, which looks at creating better policy for women. At the moment, we tend to, well, not just at the moment, for over a long history of time, we've checked, we've largely segregated out what is uh, policy that is about women, policy that is to improve women's lives. So whether we're talking about childcare, whether we're talking about the gender pay gap, whether we're talking about violence against women, these things have been separate. The purpose of gender mainstreaming is for it to be part of the development of policy, regardless of what the policy area is. So if we're talking about the Scottish government budget, if we're talking about um, environment, if we're talking about transport, if we're talking about childcare, if we're talking about education, that it would be mainstreamed and a, a, a setting a standard to consider the impact on women, to can have a gendered analysis. So think about women when policy is being created. Now, this isn't something new that we're asking for or have been talking about for a very long time now. This is actually a, a global standard. Uh, Emma will be able to tell me if I go wrong here, but um, from the um, Beijing Convention in 1995, I think it is. That's a nod from Emma, I've got remembered that. Um, with over 100 legislators from 100 countries participating in this and signing up to gender mainstreaming in some form. And yet we are over 20 years later and we're not seeing that in the development of policy and certainly not in the delivery and implementation of policy on the ground. 
what tends to happen a lot of the time uh, when we're doing when we're talking about gender mainstreaming is there's a lot of um pressure a lot of work done by feminist organizations like in gender like others to retrofit gender equality into certain policies that are decisions that have been made or once questions have been asked in a consultation to provide input through those about why, why a gendered analysis is needed. The purpose of gender mainstreaming is not convincing people of a gendered analysis or having to do that as an external party or external pressure, is that it's a normal part of the policy making process. One of the things that's particularly important when we talk about gender mainstreaming is gender mainstreaming is not advocating and should not ever be thought, thought of in a way as, as women being a homogenous group. So it's not gender mainstreaming because women are all the same. You can have an intersectional analysis, intersectional um, engagement, intersectional data as part of your gender mainstreaming. Those things are not against one another. And sometimes I find myself having to have that conversation with policymakers uh, more often than I'd like to. And it's not that uh, we're looking for women to be considered a homogenous group and therefore that's how you make policy. Good gender mainstreaming understands that women are not a homogenous group and thinks about women of colour, thinks about disabled women, thinks about working class women, thinks about um, single parent families, the majority of which are women. And so it's really critical that ge in gender mainstreaming has an intersectional lens, has intersectional disaggregated data. The purpose of gender mainstreaming is making it a norm and embedding it into the policy making process so we don't have to retrofit so much and make it fit for purpose later. It is fit for purpose at the very point the ideas around a policy are being generated. We look at it and we think, how do we improve the lives of women through this, this budget? How does this environmental policy work for women? How does higher education policy work for women? Because gender mainstreaming analysis and the input of women across the board, a diverse range of women, is a standard. It's expected of us at the global, global level. There is a lot of warm words, rhetoric, and, and I do think um, will to do it. My concern is whether it is happening well, how well it's happening and how far it's embedded, particularly when it comes to um, financial decisions and budgeting within Scotland. So that's just a bit of an overview and, um, well, essentially my bugbears about um, gender mainstreaming. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, um, hearing more about the report from InGender who've done a power of work in this area. Uh, and I'm very much happy to answer questions that are specifically about how do we do that? An intersectional analysis, gender mainstreaming and creating it as a standard, as a norm expectation, whether it was a local authority or whether it was national um, policy making, that gender mainstreaming becomes um, not just competent, but something that we don't have to remind people about later. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Talat, for that. Um, and uh, yeah, beautifully segueing into uh, and, uh, Emma, who's going to be talking through the report we launched um, and I, today. And I suppose just talk about yeah, uh, why we've launched the report. As Talat says, mainstreaming is something that appears in almost every report we do. It's so integral to lots of things we do. So we've uh, we've put it all in a paper <laughs> because we talk about it so much. So um, Emma is going to talk uh, through that for us now. Thank you very much, Emma. Thanks very much, Alice. Yeah, always delighted to talk about uh, mainstreaming. So um, just waiting for my slideshow to manifest into a slideshow. Okay, there we go. So um, today I'm going to be talking really briefly about the extremely exciting uh, and transformational possibilities of uh, gender mainstreaming and talking about some of the challenges we see for the gender mainstreaming project in Scotland, which is why we have produced the report today, uh, which sets out a number of recommendations for Scottish Government, for other public bodies to take up to ensure that the transformational vision of gender mainstreaming actually realises in the lives of women and girls in Scotland. So why do we need gender mainstreaming is the first question. Well, we still see in Scotland today, gender uh, making a huge difference in men's and women's lives. 
And at Engender, we talk about gender as being the collection of norms, stereotypes, uh, structures in society that ensure that sex is a hierarchy. And some of these are here. So we still see that men's violence against women victimizes one in three women, but also affects all women. And there was more data out today about the number of girls in our society who experience public street harassment and the effect that that has on girls and women uh, and how frightened women are to, for example, um, go out at night during lockdown and take some exercise. We still see women earning less doing different types of work and needing to work at different times of the day uh, because women do the majority of care for children, for disabled people and for older people. And we also see still an overwhelming overrepresentation of men in decision making. And in some levels of decision making in Scotland, women are about a quarter of those who are elected or represented. And so there are enormous gaps in terms of who gets to make the decision uh, about what happens in our society and for whose benefit. So mainstreaming, as Talat said, is not a new idea. It's older than 25 years old. Uh, and it's something which feminists invented um, in order to kind of get around the idea that gender equality, women's equality and rights were a kind of side project to the main business of running a state or running a public body. And so this is one of the definitions which is used um, often in Europe. And it talks about how gender mainstreaming is the integration of this gender perspective, which we sometimes call a gender lens into every stage of the policy process. So when policymakers are designing a policy, implementing a policy, monitoring it, evaluating whether it's actually worked uh, to make citizens' lives better, they should do all of those things with a view to promoting equality between women and men. And the definition goes on. It means looking at how policies will impact on the life and on the position of both women and men, and then taking responsibility to make changes to those policies if that is necessary. So that is, as you can appreciate, a pretty transformational project. It means that when public bodies are doing their thing, whether that's a health board, a university, a college, a school, a local authority, the Scottish government itself. Um, it should be thinking about how to advance equality between women and men, as well as meet the specific needs of women and men and boys and girls. The way that Engender uses mainstreaming in our policy advocacy work, um, we spend all of our time really trying to make uh, Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament do things differently. We spend our time trying to make sure that all the policy that gets made, all the legislation gets made, brings women's lives and reality into its heart and really addresses and meets those needs. And so we do two things with mainstreaming. First of all, uh, where mainstreaming is happening, we try and make that work better, because that means that not only us, um, but all of the women's organizations, all advocates for women's equality and rights, individual women working in communities have got a better chance of um, encouraging uh, the public bodies nearest them to make better decisions for women. We also use those tools ourselves to advance women's equality and rights. And so we say, you haven't done this mainstreaming work properly. And um, that means that you need to think again about the extent to which, for example, your transport policy meets the needs of women and girls. Uh, you're carrying out an equality impact assessment. We think these are the important issues that you need to think about in terms of transport. And um, so we're both trying to make mainstreaming work itself and also using the mainstreaming tools um, that exist. So in terms of gender mainstreaming then, what are the building blocks that make gender mainstreaming work? And this list is drawn from the report that we've put out. Um, we've done a bit of a review of um, gender mainstreaming approaches in different uh, states and societies around the world, um, as of course have many other feminists um, working on the project of gender mainstreaming. And there are some common features to what works inside a country or a state to make gender mainstreaming a reality. 
Um, one of the important things is that there be some kind of body or department within government that is responsible for um, gender equality. And I'm using the language of gender equality here. Within Engender, we would talk more about women's equality and rights, um, but right across policy land uh, internationally, um, gender equality is the way that's normally framed. There should be some kind of formal gender mainstreaming process. Uh, and in Scotland, that is the public sector equality GT and equality impact assessment. Um, together, those things should encourage and enable, require uh, public bodies to do gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming, of course, depends on having good inputs. And if we don't know what the different ex experiences are for women and men, then it can be very difficult to make good decisions. And so something gen in gender consistently advocates for, but is also a critical part of gender mainstreaming is sex disaggregated, gender sensitive data. And that is data which is broken down um, into sex as a characteristic, um, but also pays attention to some of those gendered dynamics of women's lives. So looks at things like street harassment when it's thinking about transport data, uh, for example. Talent mentioned the budget and how important the budget is. And certainly you can learn a lot if you follow the money in terms of what a priority is for an organization or for a state. And so one of the things that gender mainstreaming includes is the idea of gender budget analysis. And that's a special gender mainstreaming approach uh, to thinking about how a state raises its revenues through taxation and then spends them uh, through the spending programs targeted at meeting its citizens' needs. And right across the world, um, feminists work towards in integrating gender budget analysis into the budget because that is a tool for showing where the spend goes, for enabling us to see uh, where the money is spent and on who and why and for what and what differences in life experience that leads to. Leadership is also vitally important for gender mainstreaming, and that means those with power, responsibility, uh, taking account of the fact that gender mainstreaming should be happening and asking questions about it. And that can be senior political leaders, that can be senior officials within Scottish government, and um, that can also be things like our media asking questions about who benefits from different programs and focusing attention on those. Uh, a lot of all of this depends on something we call gender competence, uh, which is the knowledge and the skills and the understanding of the differences between men's and women's lives and the role that gender plays in that in order to think about it at an important moment in policy development. And something we have long advocated for is that all civil servants inside government should have a basic level of gender competence so they can understand those differences between men's and women's lives. And as with all things, accountability is really important. If you're required to do all of the things in the list above, but no one ever holds you accountable if you don't, uh, then there is a chance that you're going to drop um, the need to do those things in favor of other processes and priorities which you are accountable for. And so it's really vital, and we see this in states around the world, that people be held responsible, institutions and organizations be held responsible when they fail to think about women and girls. In Scotland, we have a number of legal frameworks that drive mainstreaming, uh, and they, they started uh, really for women's equality and rights with the Equality Act in 2006, which um, uh, required public bodies to live up to what was then called the gender equality duty and to carry out gender impact assessment. Uh, now, you will have clocked that this means that public bodies should have been doing some kind of impact assessment, thinking about women's uh, equality and rights for 14 years, and yet they don't seem to be very good at it yet. And I think we share that frustration. So the Equality Act 2006 um, was then followed by the Equality Act 2010, 
And that got rid of the specific gender equality duty with its focus on women and men and replaced it with a broader public sector equality duty, which nonetheless includes gender impact assessment and a variety of other mechanisms, and some of which Lindsay is going to talk about in a bit. Uh, and we have seen since then uh, public bodies to a variable level of quality and with a variable set of outcomes work away on this gender mainstreaming project. Um, I've also added to the list CEDAW, which is the UN Women's Bill of Rights. Uh, and I've added that there because mainstreaming is something that they constantly ask states who've signed up to CEDAW to deliver on. Uh, and that's because they require substantive equality between women and men, not only equality of opportunity, but what is often called equality of outcome. And that is an imperfect uh, but useful tool to us as we're trying to um, encourage public bodies to go further with their ge gender mainstreaming work. So what is the out outcomes and outputs of all of this? Well, we're, we still see, I think, um, with regard to Scottish government, a whole spectrum of different levels um, to which gender mainstreaming is carried out. So some policies, and the, particularly the policy areas where women's equality and rights organisations have been most active uh, and have had most sustained focus on them, um, we see gender analysis is fundamental to the policy uh, and that really the whole policy is shaped uh, by the purpose and theory of women's equality and rights. And an example of that is the violence against women policy equally safe. At the other end of the spectrum, we unfortunately still do see uh, quite a lot of policies where there is a little mention of uh, gender analysis, women as a particular group with distinct needs, uh, but really no substantive efforts to address uh, the difference in needs that women have. And I would put employability policy largely into that box. And in between, uh, we see different levels. Uh, so the Child Poverty Action Plan um, had very good gender analysis that was given quite substantive consideration. Uh, women's equality wasn't the whole focus of the policy, but it was really well integrated within it. And then there are things like planning um, where in gender um, managed to get some gender sensitivity into the legislation itself most recently, uh, but we're still to see the real impact of that in terms of guidance and policy. Um, so a very mixed picture across the whole piece. So what has Engender done with this piece of work? Um, I'd really encourage you to uh, read the report. Um, I think that some of this stuff is so technical, it is quite difficult to summarize in a very brief presentation. Uh, but what we've done in our report is to describe some of the key features of gender mainstreaming and the detail that around the world is delivering on equality and rights for women. And we've then compared that to the Scottish approach. There is undoubtedly some political commitment uh, to women's equality and rights at the moment in Scotland. And we are seeing um, some uh, willingness to think about some of those building blocks of gender mainstreaming and make improvements to those. Um, but nonetheless, we've got quite a long list of recommendations for change. Uh, and I'll just summarize those very briefly for you now. Um, so we think fundamentally, and Lindsay may go on to discuss this in greater detail, the public sector equality duty is really not working for women. And we want to see uh, the approach taken which Talat describes, where there's intersectionality, but there is also a very clear and sustained recognition of the specific inequalities that different groups of women face. Um, for sure, we need better gender sensitive sex disaggregated data. Uh, Scottish government's making some movements in that direction, but we need them to go further and we need them to go faster. Um, we have long thought that there should be much more focus 
uh, and leadership on equality within the cabinet. And so we think that there should be a um, cabinet secretary with responsibility for equality uh, alongside mandating very clearly um, the equality priorities that each cabinet secretary should be progressing within their own directorate. Um, Scottish Government has already taken up one of our proposals, which is for a resourced equality directorate within Scottish Government, uh, but we think that needs an even larger budget to be truly successful in terms of the work that it's doing. Um, the equality function inside Scottish Government is massively oversubscribed, uh, and sometimes it can be quite hit and miss in terms of which other directorates uh, receive their focus and their attention. It can be a bit like um, a cab rank system in which all, if all the taxis have gone, then you just have to wait uh, your turn. Um, in terms of gender mainstreaming itself, we think that the whole project is so complicated, it needs a bit of a strategy and a change program in and of itself. Uh, there's a lot to do inside government to ensure that gender mainstreaming is a reality, not least the tricky task of training almost all civil servants in the basics of gender competence. Uh, and so we think that that needs the same kind of attention that something like GDPR um, requires, for example, where this is just a really important priority that has to be delivered on. We also think, of course, that the Equality Directorate isn't enough in and of itself. Uh, and so we think that um, the, um, the oh, sorry, I've just clicked off the side, the, um, we think that the expertise within the Equality Unit itself uh, needs to be matched with expertise centres within other directorates of government. Uh, Talat mentioned the difficulty of getting some of these agendas taken seriously by the economy directorates. Um, they have got a plan to introduce a centre of expertise um, off the back of recommendations we've made through the COVID recovery process, and we want to see that replicated across other directorates too. A quality impact assessment is fundamentally not working and so we think we need both a better process and more accountability and senior leadership um, with responsibility for those impact assessments and the results on public policy. Uh, during COVID we have been quite surprised to be asked um, over and over again to feed into EQIAs that have been taking place after the policy itself has been published. And that is obviously um, not uh, appropriate and not, we think, compliant with the law. Um, we certainly need better enforcement of all of the public sector equality duty, uh, which is places legal requirements on public bodies. And yet the enforcement mechanism we do have is either regulation through the Equality and Human Rights Commission or seeking judicial review by individual charities or individual people, which is just not appropriate. Uh, so we want to see a significant increase in the monitoring and accountability mechanisms within Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament itself. Uh, as I said at the top, gender mainstreaming is a transformational project uh, which feminists created in order to see public bodies deliver the radical shifts in women's equality and rights that as feminist organisations we really want to see and need to see. Uh, and we hope that the recommendations we've proposed in our report uh, will take us steps forward to seeing that difference in the lives of women and girls in Scotland. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Emma. Um, um, as Emma says, it is, um, it's a chunky old report. So that was a brilliant whistle stop tour of, of what's in there. And I've, I keep popping the link to that report um, in the chat and there'll also be blogs um, coming out about different aspects of that throughout the week. So do check that out. Um, and thanks to folk that are submitting questions, do keep them coming. We also have some sent um, in advance, which I'll be asking out as well. Um, I'm answering in text the ones that are sort of more factual, but otherwise we'll, we'll um, give them to all the panellists um, at the end. Um, and I'm now uh, delighted to welcome Lindsay, who has battled with the tech, um, failing on many occasions, but is here and is going to talk to us um, about Close the Gaps work on uh, gender mainstreaming and um, all sorts of other wonderful things. Uh, over to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Alice. Um, can can every, can you hear me? Am I? Is this working? Yes. Excellent. Thank goodness. Can you see me as well? 
Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay. Thank goodness I had more than one laptop in the house. Um, Thanks very much for having me and thank you so much to Engender for producing this extremely timely report. Um, as Emma said, and gender mainstreaming has been um, a requirement for public bodies for such a long time and yet um, it really feels like we're not really much forward than we were when the gender equality duty um, came in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific duties are, as they relate to gender and employment. Close the Gap works on the causes of women's labour market in, in Scotland and I'm the policy manager there and I basically lead on um, our policy work in the public sector. Um, and so I, I've done a lot of work around the duties. Um, Close the Gap has um, in years 2013, 15 and 17, we performed an assessment of 20% of public bodies in Scotland's compliance with the duties. Um, we uh, have done a lot of advocacy around the duties with um, the Scottish Government in terms of um, enforcement and improvement of the duties and also with individual public bodies and trying to encourage them to um, do better work around the duties. We've also developed guidance and training um, for public bodies um, on how to comply with the duty and we've done um, quite a bit of individual work with public bodies um, on their reporting, um, using data and developing action plans. Um, so gender mainstreaming is one of the specific duties um, but it sits alongside a number of other specific duties and um, public bodies have to gather um, and use employment data which is data on the composition of their staff on the development of their staff and recruitment and retention. And that, that data needs to be disaggregated by all protected characteristics. Um, so it should be possible to gender disaggregate all of it. Um, and also to look at the data for pregnancy and maternity, which is of course one of the other protected characteristics and particularly relevant for women's labor market inequality. So they're supposed to gather and use that data and use that data means for the purposes of developing equality outcomes but also for the purposes of mainstreaming that data should be able to help them to identify um, how particular employment policies and practices are working um, and so effectively should serve um, as part of a, a equality impact process to identify how um, employment policies and practices impact differently on women and men and what needs to happen to those policies and practices in order to improve matters. And that sits alongside public bodies requirement to gather gender pay gap information and also to um, gather information on occupational segregation. Um, and so that data again, gather that data is the first point, but using the data is the fundamental thing that underpins the duty. There's no point in gathering and reporting data if you're not going to do anything about it. So public bodies should be using their pay gap data and their occupational segregation data to better understand, again, the different experiences of women and men in their organisations and what specific action they should be taking to address the issues that they will undoubtedly identify. Um, so those are probably the, the parts of the duty that are, I guess, maybe most relevant to equality mainstreaming, equality outcomes being um, almost like a projectized approach to um, the most pressing inequalities that have been identified. But mainstreaming is the vehicle by which public bodies um, should be complying with the duties. And I mentioned that, um, we perform assessments every two years. We, we finished those assessments in 2017. Um, and those assessments really revealed a, a bit of a bleak picture, um, to say the least, for compliance. We saw um, a real downward trend in performance of the duty, um, as I'm sure Emma and Tala have mentioned this, uh, homogenization. So, just talking about people with protected characteristics as if that's some form of group when actually everyone has protected characteristics so everyone would sit within that group um 
and that real diminution of focus on gender equality. Um, and that kind of, that, that was shown just through every single part of the duty on employee data, which again is critical for work on um, labour market inequality, women's labour market inequality in public bodies and also mainstreaming. Most public bodies are still not gathering data for all protected characteristics. Um, most public bodies are still not gathering all the relevant data that they need to do for gender, let alone some of the, the other um, protected characteristics. And a real disappointing thing is that many bodies have made no progress in this. There's very little evidence that there have been actions taken to improve data collection systems. Um, many reports will say that they use um, the public bodies use centralised data systems that are controlled by other um, parts of the public sector and so they can't do anything about it. It's not really not an excuse. And again, this reflects that lack of gender competence in the design of data collection itself, um, as, as described in the gender support, which is obviously if you're not gathering the data, if your system isn't designed to gather the data that you need, it's you know, hampering yourself really from the outset. Um, and when we looked at those bodies that had gathered data, we found that 87% of them assessed um, as having made poor or no use of that data. Um, again, in mainstreaming reports, there's very often little or no mention of work around the gender pay gap, of work around occupational segregation, of work around any of the um, issues that they've identified by looking at their employee data, um, which is, it, it's simply not compliance with the duty. Um, and when we look at the gender pay gap reporting, um, it's, it's still, it, we're still seeing not all public bodies meet that part of the duty, which is arguably one of the simplest aspects of the duty. 20% um, of public bodies in our assessments are still not publishing them. Um, and almost half of them have done poor or no analysis and um, most of them make no changes to their policies as a result. So that again shows that that data is not being used to mainstream gender equality into their employment processes. Um, and the same really can be said of occupational segregation, only even a, a bleaker picture, only 36% of public bodies in 2017 met that duty. Um, and that feeds into the equal pay statements that public bodies are meant to be publishing, because 86% of those in our assessments were classed as poor quality. Most of them um, can be characterised as broad commitment to principles ra rather than actions or programmes of work or mainstreaming itself. Um, there's a lot of really empty language such as we will continue to do X or we will consider doing Y, um, which really um, shows it's a real lack of engagement um, with, with the duties. So we would very much agree with all of the, the findings of Engender's mainstreaming report and all of the recommendations. I think the, the primary factors are that lack of resource, um, a lack of leadership and a lack of accountability. There's a lot of really committed equality leads in the sector who put a lot of time and effort into developing work on the duty. Um, and it's very disheartening, I think, for um, those equality leads to um, really be, be met with so many barriers, a lack of resource, a lack of prioritisation, constantly being pushed into other, other things because equality has been deprioritized within, deprioritized rather within their organisations. Um, and that kind of, what, what we know about equality leads from what we've seen is that there's, you know, we see a lack of continuity. So quite often when you come to the next um, report, it will be a different equalities lead who's taking that forward. And certainly for me, there's a big question about um, that high turnover that I have seen in my own assessments, um, how much that is driven by, I guess, frustration at, at the, the process and how difficult it is to really push through good quality work within their organisation. Um, one of the most troubling things that I have witnessed as part of my work in the public sector on compliance with the duty is uh, a small number, but a number of public bodies that I've worked with um, 
to develop equality outcomes or work on mainstreaming um, and those what I would consider to be better quality outcomes are put forward to um, senior leadership for sign off and they are um, there's real resistance there to the ambition of the outcomes um, the specificity of the outcomes and in a number of cases I have heard have been told that um, leadership have said actually you need to set outcomes that we've already met which is really showing a lack of I mean, I would say, I would go so far as to say an entirely um, oppositional approach to the duty, um, a, a lack of prioritisation, a, a lack of genuine engagement with the duty, and also a complete um, denial of the purpose of the duty in itself. So I think leaving it up to public bodies has not worked. I know those um, equalities leads who are most committed and um, all equalities leads I would say want more direction um, to do the work and they want more resource and they also want more leadership so I would say that the findings of um, Engenders report are reflective of what equality leads need and want within the sector in order to comply and what public bodies as a whole do um, and I think right now the argument for um, gender mainstreaming is particularly germane to the current crisis because it's not why public bodies should do it, it's why shouldn't they do it. If they are not gender mainstreaming, they are not developing good quality policy and by definition they're not delivering good value for public money. Um, so um, there's no argument for developing policy that is not the best that it can be. And so for me, that is a fundamental argument for better gender mainstreaming. Thanks.